this morning we are going to look at what I've titled like father, like son. So when we say like father, like son, some of us will just excuse ourselves, ah, I'm not a son. But at least when, we know when the Bible is talking about sons, it's making reference to both female and male. So when God says um, you are a son of God, it's not just talking about the male gender, it's talking about every one of us. Look at what Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 says. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So when you talk about like, uh, the, the, the way this, this um, line started from me, when it says someone is like their father or like um, she looks like her, her mom or something, is because what there's um, a form of resemblance or there's um, a characteristics of that person. It's just like our sons. When, when you tell them to line up, you can point out, okay, this son, mommy, this son, daddy, and we have the hybrid. That one is, <laughs> that's the no consolation, no fighting. <laughs> that's what I call him, that God doesn't want us to fight. Just like this one is, is mixture, hybrid. So that's how he's in. But uh, uh, more than the physical resemblance, when there are some things that I always joke about our son, that if they bring me to a room and my sons are finished eating and like, they blindfold me, I just need to feel the table mats and the table. I know who sat where. I can tell you who sat where. That, okay, this person, just based on how the table feels, or how the table mat feels, I can tell you who, who, who sat on where. So, and it's based on, I'll say some of us, when we eat, we enjoy our food. So we can, that's me, like, you can eat with both of your hands, your legs, whatever. Just make sure you enjoy the food. But some people, when they eat, like, they pick the, they hold the spoon with two hands. And that's my husband. And we have one of our sons that is like that. So it's not just the physical resemblance. They also have other characteristics that they've picked up. So can people actually look at us and say, this is the son of God? Do we have characteristics in our life? Do we have, um, do we have behaviors? Do we have traits? Do you, like, can someone just look at you? Yes, this is a child of God. Remember the story of the apostles? After everything that was said and done, they said, these people must have been with Jesus. They just looked at them, the manner of life and everything about them. And the conclusion was that these people must have been with Jesus. So that's what we want to look at this morning. And we are going to continue... And the same thing we talked about, like when we were talking about the Father. So there are still certain things that, that makes God, God. Like that makes his fatherhood over us so strong. I'll continue from the ones I started last week. Some of the things that make God, God. And makes him a unique father in his own right. That he has no rival. He has no one that you can actually... You can't compare that all because, um, because of the experiences you've had with your physical father. Then you can now translate that into, into the, God, I mean, the fatherhood of God. So that's what we want to look at this morning. And the, the, the aim of this study also is to help us straighten out our concept of God. Because if our God concept is faulty, our self-concept is going to be faulty as well. If you have an issue with who God is as a father to you, then you're going to have a problem as a child. If you have a problem of God concept, like who he is, if you like, okay, I accept God as the almighty, I accept him as the provider, I accept him, I don't have an issue with him being my healer, but when it comes to the issue of him being my father, I, I am struggling with that, and it's no fault of us, a lot of us, some of us, we, we grew up with fathers that were very nice, and you actually pray that, I pray that if you are a lady, that I marry a man that is like my father, or I pray to, to, for my children to have this type of a father. And from, for other people, you know, like, oh, well, my father tried. He, he wasn't perfect, but he did the best I could. And for other people, like, father, I just delete them, like, that memory of that father. Like, you don't even want to have anything to, to do with that father. And when you start, when you come to the knowledge of Christ, you start portraying that image of the father you've experienced unto God. And that's where the problem comes. But this morning, we want God to heal us. For it doesn't matter if the, we've had the best of fathers or we've had uh, a mediocre father or a father was not that we can't even say was there at all. But God is going to reveal himself that he is unmatched and unrivaled by any earthly father's experience that we might have ever experienced. 
this morning. So we talked about him that he nourishes us. So another thing that if we, if we have issues with, with the father that we know, there's going to be, let like me just look at some biblical examples that some had issues with their fathers. Not, not the father, not the father himself being the uh, problem, but the understanding of who he is. And the first person is the, the elder brother of the prodigal son. The elder brother of the, because the, we're always talking about the prodigal son, but the elder brother himself also had his own issue. Look at his story in Luke chapter, Luke chapter 15, verse 25 to 32. It says, meanwhile, the older brother, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. So the first issue is the father has killed a fattened calf. That's part of the elder brother's property because everything the father has already belongs to the brother. So it's almost like, okay, my own thing, you're using to entertain this prodigal son. So that's one issue. It says the, the elder brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slept for you. Did you hear that word? I have slept for you. All of the things is working. Is he, who, who, who owns them? His own. So why would you think what God has given and trusted into you to take care of is slaving to, to multiply it? Can you see where the problem is coming from now? It says what? I've slept for you. I never, once, I never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And I'm going to rest here a bit. Because a lot of us, we, we do all of these things. It's almost like um, we are trying to bribe God into, into loving us. It's like, oh, I come to church. I'm a worker. I sweep. I do children's church. I do all of these things for you. Like, it doesn't, it's good. But those things in themselves does not merit the love of God. So you can't, you can't capitalize on the things we do. We are not into um, a performance relationship with the Lord. We are not into a performance relationship with the Lord. Either you do or you don't do. The Lord loves you. So he said, I said, and in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. He owns all of those things. He says what? He says, then the servants... I think I, Luke chapter 15, I think I, I, I can read from it. It says, and he asked one of his, it says, the other brother was angry and wouldn't go. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all those years I've slept for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet... When this son of yours came back after squandering your money on prostitute, how did he know? There's no social media, so he wouldn't have posted it anywhere. So how did he know that it was on prostitute that he used it for? So it's almost like some of us make assumption on God's forgiveness that, okay, if someone has gone astray, that means it's almost like you already have the things that you think, oh, if someone says they are, they've sinned, like, oh, fornication, still in line. Because there was no social media. And like what Pastor was saying, if, except if the word actually traveled. Like somebody, ah, we saw your brother, like what got back. So he's like making all of these assumptions about this brother. He says, yet when this son of yours came back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, look there, son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is whose? Is yours. Everything I have is yours. And some of us, we are, we are blaming God for the things we are not enjoying. And when, when you see other people enjoying the blessings of God, you're almost like, are you the only one in the Father's house? Like, why, why are you? You, you, have, you are taking offense at all the blessings that other people are enjoying. But you've forgotten that you're, you also have access to all of those things. So are you minding other people's business that you've forgotten that all of those things are yours as well? That you're looking at, oh, this person is, is, is always changing jobs. Oh, this person is... And some, we take offense at those things. You have forgotten that you have access to all the same thing. 
all of the things that those people are enjoying, the blessings, the good health, the sound mind, they all belong to you. Like you shouldn't be offended at other people enjoying the blessings of God. And verse 13 says, we had, we had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now is found. And we look at the story is what? Some of us, we are offended at the father's mercies. That's the like, why, why? Okay, it's okay that he comes back home, but do we have to celebrate? Do we have to kill all of these things? Do we have to call a party? Just let him come inside and just go back and, and be quiet. We don't have to make so much noise. But remember the, the story, this, the same story that Jesus was, when he was saying this um, parable, when he talked about the lost sheep, the lost coin. When that coin was lost, it says what you would what you light a lamp, you clear everything so that you can look for them. So when God is going to celebrate about us, he doesn't do it quietly. He, he doesn't do it quietly. Remember, he says what when Jesus Christ went into that, he said what? He, he, he made a what? A, a show of the enemy. That's what he did when he went into that grave. So when he was going to win that victory for us, he made a show of the enemy. So when God is going to rejoice about you, he's not going to just, wow, thank you, and do it quietly. And, so, and that's why it says, there is joy in heaven over one righteous person that repents than over 99 uh, righteous person, when over a sinner that repents. So the Father is always rejoicing over us. That's one thing you have to remember. He's always rejoicing over you. There is no celebration that the Lord calls for on your behalf that you think is, um, is God being wasteful. There is no celebration that the Lord calls over you that is, is, uh, that is trying to be wasteful. No. It's just, he owns, he owns everything on earth. So if he's going to close down the heavens to celebrate a child that comes back, don't you think that is worth it? And a lot of us, we get offended, especially if, we've, if we gave our life to Christ for uh, maybe you've been born again for five years, two years, and you see a new convert. And you see the person hungry for God, reading the next thing, is like total immersion in God. And you can see the way the Lord is working with the person. The next thing they put that person, okay, at this department, be the HOD. The next thing, oh, this person is departmental. Like, you just see the promotion and you're like, okay, we, we've been doing this God's work for a long time. How come? You get offended at the mercy of God. You get offended when God is showing his faithfulness to your brother. Instead of you join the party and ask, where, where can I, what can I, where, which streets can I close down to celebrate this person that has come back into the household of God? And some of us, we don't have that understanding that we belong to him. Like, everything the Father has belongs to us. You need no permission to enjoy those things that have been freely given to you. And when we serve God, we serve him from a place. What we do for the Father is, is, is a response of our love to the things he has done for us. All of the things we do for the Father that we, we serve in church, we help other people, is a sign to respond to the love of the Father to us. It's not for us to prove anything. We're not trying to prove anything. It's just a response for us to show that, okay, we, we, in return of all of those things that you are freely giving us, we are responding to your love. So everything we do for God, we are not counting it as slaving for God. Like the, the prodigal, the, the elder brother said, he says, well, I've been slaving for you all of those years. That's not our mentality. And I said earlier on that, well, he has a performance-driven relationship with his father. Even though we are, uh, some of us think we have to walk we have to work to merit the things that, has been, that belongs to us by inheritance. So that's the first person. And the second story we're going to look at is the unfaithful steward. And I'm saying this story that to, to help us understand that if we have a faulty understanding of the father, how we relate to him is going to be faulty because we are not going to take advantage of all of the things that have been made available to us. Look at the story of the, um, the unfaithful st um, steward. Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, verse 24 to 26. Just the, the background story, there were three servants, and the master was going out. So the first servant, he gave five talents to. The second, he gave two talents to. And the last servant, he gave one talent to. And the Bible records that he gave those talents to them based on their abilities. It wasn't because he preferred one person more than the other. So he didn't give, oh, this is my favorite child, so I'll give that person five. Okay, I like this one second, so I'll give, no, that wasn't the basis. He gave them based on their abilities. So look at this, um, when we're going to give a report, look at what this 
person that was giving the one's um, talent said, he said what? Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you did not plant, and gathering crops you did not cultivate. Is this the same master that gave them the talents? Do you think this was the same servant? Because the, all the other two came, both the, the first two came back to give a report. So if they thought this man was actually, as this person described, would they have actually invested what the Lord gave them? No. If that's the character of this man, then there's no point of like, okay, we know this man is, is, not, is, um, is a thief. There's no, there's no point multiplying the money he has stolen. They will just leave it there. If that's the character of this man in truth. Look at it, he says, I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. It says, but the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew, knew I harvested crops I did not plant and gathered crops I did not cultivate, why didn't you take my money to the bank? And that was what he was saying to the man. So if we, if we start having all of this um, based on the stories we have heard or based on the experiences we've seen other people or you hear stories that I have served God for a very long time. I know God is faithful, but there are certain things they cannot do. Or sometimes people don't even come out to say that. But you watch their lives, you're like, okay, this person has been serving God for a long time. But there's really nothing to show for it. They are faithful, but there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing in their life to actually prove that this God is working. And some of us start picking our stories from there that, well... I'll serve God. I'll go all out and help myself. I will, I'll be successful in life. When I have time, I'll serve God. Like Some of us start developing our characters or our relationship with God based on what we've experienced or based on what we've seen in other people. But what God is trying to tell us is that don't look at all of those things. Look at me. Let me explain me to you. Give me a chance to actually show you who I am. So that's what we are trying to aim at this morning, that we want to know God for ourselves. We want to know, we want God to reveal himself to us so that we can actually understand his character. You know, in the Bible, in the, in, in the Old Testament, there wasn't any much use of people calling God Father. Though he would say concerning the children of Israel, these are my sons, these are my um, children, I've begotten them. But there weren't people that actually called, it wasn't a common thing for people to call God Father then. Until when Jesus came, and that was what offended the Pharisees, because when he say, says anything, I do what my father does, like, uh, who, who, like from where? And that was where the offense of the Pharisees and the Sadducees about Jesus Christ, that was the, big, the biggest challenge they have with him. So he came along so that he can actually show us what the original intent of God for us were. Because when, when God created Adam and Eve, that was the, the first thing he did. He came in the cool of the night. He had a discussion with them. It wasn't them praying, but he had a real relationship with them. They talked face to face. But because we lost that, so Jesus Christ came to restore that. And that's why he kept saying everything he said over and over. My father did this. Hardly will you hear. Jesus didn't call God um, the mighty man of battle. The, like, you didn't hear him use all of those titles for God. The most title he used was my father, my father. And that's the biggest of that title of God that we can actually personalize. We can call him Jehovah Nisi as we've been learning. We can call him Jehovah Shammah, all of those names. But the biggest revelation of God we can carry is his revelation as a father for us. If that one is settled, all the Jehovah's will, we, they will come along. If we can settle the issue of his fatherhood over our lives, the other ones will come along. So look at the other characteristics of, 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 of God. I will just read some other scriptures to us. John chapter 8, verse 39 to 44. So when we talk about, like I just explained, God, we, we can't say God created everything, but God is not the father of everybody. Did you get that? God created everyone. But he's not the father of everyone. So for us to, to be a child of God, for, he to, for God to be our father, then that, there has to be a place of coming into the family of God. And that happens when we, when we give our life to Christ. John chapter 3 verse 34 to 39 to 44 says, And they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. 
Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and came forth from God. None have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. That's where they took offense. <laughs> so if you, are not, if you claim to be the child or the children of God that you have, then you should understand me. You have, you have things that you say in your family that it's family joke. Once you say it, everybody in the family understands that, yes, yeah, we are together. So if, and that's what Jesus was saying, that if all of those things I'm saying, you guys don't understand, then you can't claim to belong to this family. So if you don't belong to this family, that means you have another father. And the father is who? The devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. That is, is just part of him. For he's a liar and the father of it. And saying Jesus and confirming that God, we come into that father, I mean, into that family of God by being born again. Look at another scripture. It says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So, who are the people that are have the right to become children of God. Those who receive him. To those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood. Nor of the will of the flesh. Nor of the will of man. But of God. So those are those that would have the right. To be called the sons of God. Look at um, Romans chapter 8 verse 14 again. It says for as many as are led by the spirit of God. These are the sons of God. Remember the scripture we read earlier on. It says, you do not know God. You, you cannot receive the spirit that comes from God because you are not of his. So they can't receive the Holy Spirit because they are not born again because they haven't received the life of Jesus. And that's why it's saying those that are led by the spirit of God, those are, those are the people we call the sons of God. So the other characteristics, I'm going to go through this ones very fast. We, we started out, we mentioned four last week. I'll go through this other one, five, five more. But I want us to, to actually, where I want us to rest this um, morning's message is why we look like our father. We said the, the message says it was like father, like son. So we want to actually sit down there. So I'm going to go through this other one, the other traits of a father. He loves, the father loves. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 33 the Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. So we already armored so much on the love of the Father for us. We rested there a bit last week. Another scripture, 1 John 3 verse 1, it says, See what an incredible quality of love the Father has shown to us. I love the way this translation says it. I know, um, I think King James just says, see, um, it, it says, see the love of the Father for us. So, but this one says, an incredible, if he said incredible love, that's still good. But he didn't, he said, well, it's an incredible quality of love the Father has shown to us that we, sh that we would be permitted to be named and called and counted the children of God. And so, we are. That is who you are. You are a child of God. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. This is how incredible it is. The same scripture in the New Living Translation says, says see how very much our Father loves us. It is not just a small love. It says, see how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. The same scripture in the message says, What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We are called children of God. That's who we really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously. Because it has no idea who he is and what he is up to. The world, they don't know. The world has no understanding of who the Father is. John chapter 15 verse 9 says, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. 
abide in my love. In God's love is where you belong. Make a tent for yourself in the love of the Father and abide there. So the second thing the Father does, he commands. The Father commands. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 20 says, it says, my son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Keep your father's command and do not forsake the love of your mother. And the father, he delights in the son. The father that we have, he, he, he takes pleasure in us. He's not, um, you know, sometimes when you say you have children, like you did not plan for them. You wanted to have two kids and two or three showed up afterwards. It's almost like, you know, we did not plan for you. So you start like whatever the older one used and is left over, you give to that child like because you are not part of the budget. Well, that's not the way God treats us. That's not like you are already accounted for like before the foundations of the word. He has already he planned you. You are part of his agenda. So you're part of his agenda. So he takes delight in us. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12. says, For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Just as the father, the son in whom he delights in. So correction and him taking delight in us, they walk hand in hand. So the fact that the father loves us does not mean that you allow us to get away with anything or do whatever we want to do. No. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says, for the Lord your God is living among you. is a mighty Savior. He will take the light in you with gladness. The Lord will take the delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful song. You need to look at that scripture in other translation. It's almost like you have um, a child and you're dancing over the child, singing over the child. That's the kind of love the father has over us not not just in um an analogy that's the reality the father is singing over you this father is rejoicing over us the same scripture in our amplifier says the lord your god is in the midst of you a mighty one a savior who saves he will rejoice over you with joy he will, he will rest in silent satisfaction and in his love. He will be silent and make no mention of your past sins. He says he will make no mention of your past sins or even recall them. He will exalt over you with singing. So we, I think by now the issue of um, our past sin, God bringing up our past sin should be settled once and for all, Right? Like that is said to, because we've, we've seen it over and over in the scripture. God saying, he says, what? Well, his love abides forever. He says, your past sin you will not remember or even recall them. So that is it. So the next one is what? We said he takes delight in us. And we've talked, I, I already alluded to that, that he chastises us. The Lord disciplines us. It's part of his fatherhood. If he doesn't discipline us, then that means he doesn't have authority over us. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 5 says us, you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. It's part of the package. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 12 it says, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Whom the Lord loves, he corrects. So if you're not having correction in your life, like all oh, you go to the Lord, he's, I love you, he's speaking love over you, he's speaking that I've forgiven you. There's no time the Lord is telling you stop that nonsense. Like if you don't go to the presence of God and he's telling you to stop doing certain things, then you have to check. Maybe you have um, a sensor that blocks out correction so you have to go back and check so it's a full package the way he's speaking love over you the way he's speaking mercy over you the way he's speaking gently over you so he's also speaking correction correction is to align us to his person that's what correction is to align us so that we are really representing him so like father like sons the perfect example of this was jesus and god he, he made two declarations over jesus there are two times in the scripture that it was recorded that a voice from heaven spoke concerning Jesus. So we want to look at those scriptures and what are the things God said to Jesus so we can know what the Lord is saying to us. So in case some of us are no longer hearing audible voice and we are reading our scripture, we can't find us in the Bible. So what is the Lord saying over us? So we can look at 
Jesus, who is the, the model child, like I'll call him, like everything the Father wants to say to us, he, he said to Jesus so that we can look at him. In case you're wondering, okay, I'm not hearing God. I don't know what God is saying to me. You can actually go back to the scripture. What has the Lord spoken to Jesus? And you can actually take those words for yourself. That like, This is the word the Lord is speaking over me as well. The first time the Lord spoke over Jesus was in... Okay, so this one, I, I didn't want to say it, but I will just say that. So another thing is the, the father is grieved when we sin against him. So it's not, it's not just, you know, sometimes after, if you have a child, after warning them, not, not children, like especially young adults, after warning them for a long time, you say, I'll just leave you to yourself. I'm going to speak French. Wabambe. <laughs> it means that, what's the English translation now? You meet it there, but... Uh, it's almost like after correcting a child for a long time and they are not yielding what to what you're saying, it's almost like you're going to deal with it in the future. So you're going to, this thing is going to come up. So it's almost like you've left them to themselves. But when it comes to God, God doesn't abandon us to our folly. Like it hurts the Lord when we misbehave and we're not paying attention to him. And that's what this scripture is saying. It says what a foolish son is a grief to his father and a bitterness to how who bore him. So when we, when we sin, it actually grieves God. So it's not like God is saying, oh, I will leave you to your destruction. You will meet it there. No, that's not his intention for us. It grieves him. And his, his heart is that we'll come back home. Just like the prodigal son did. We'll come back home to actually ask his forgiveness. So the first scripture I'm going to read, um, yeah, Hebrew chapter 1. That was one of the... Um, um, Hebrew chapter, I'm going to read from John. But this one, when you're talking about Jesus Christ as the representation of who, who we are supposed to follow, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, And he is the radiance of the glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of of the majesty on high. So Jesus is the what? Exact representation of who we are supposed to follow. So look at this now. So John 14 verse 1 to 11 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are what? Mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going and how we can know the way. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else, believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So this, Jesus Christ just went ahead that. I am, I'm, I'm showing you who the Father is. All of the things you need to know concerning the Father, I'm bringing you to you. All of the things you need to know concerning the Father, just watch my life. He says, have you been with me for so long that you don't even know who I'm talking about? So on two occasions, the Father spoke concerning the Son. So that they could hear and know what his intentions are. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 17. It says, what, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That was the first time. The second time was in Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. Why he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
hear him. So when you look at the scriptures, the two scriptures we have read, there are four things God was trying to communicate to, to the people. And that's what um, Jesus was explaining to the disciples. That if you've been with me, you would have an idea what the, the Father's heart is towards you. And the first thing is the issue of identity. The issue of identity. Who am I? You're asking, who am I? Why am I on earth? What am I capable or competent at? What am I capable of doing? What are the giftings the Lord has, has bestowed upon me? Because some of us just think, I don't even know what I like. Like, I'm, I'm just there. I like everything. Like, it's the ones I don't like that I know. But the things you like, you don't even know. So it's almost like we are so not in touch with who God has made us. But the truth is, God was so deliberate about making us. So he didn't just make, like, he didn't just concussion someone and say, okay, just go. He, like, there was so much detail about our lives. So there are, like, I mean, there are giftings, there are, there, are, there are talents that he has put in us. So that's the first thing, the, the, um, this thing that the Lord said to Jesus is trying to address. This, what, this is my beloved son. So our identity comes from what? Who we are. And that's why he said concerning Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John chapter 5, verse 16 to 19. It says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done those things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been walking until now, and I have been walking. He said, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making him equal with God. Do you see where the problem is? So it's not just because of all of the miracles. They, they took an offense at those miracles, but most importantly, they took an offense for the fact that Jesus was calling God his father. And that's what God is saying over us, that what this is my beloved son. So you are like your father. So you have to, you have to, you have to let that sink into you. I am the child. I am the daughter of my father. I'm the son of my father. So the second thing this is trying to address is the issue of love. So I talked about our identity. We take our identity from God. The second thing it addresses is the love. So you're asking, am I loved unconditionally? And we've talked about that. Like you're wondering, do I have to do anything to merit the love of the Father? Like, do I have to, to, to if I've sinned and I'm coming back to the Father, what do I have to do so that, that those sins are forgiven? But he's saying to you, you are loved unconditionally and you're treasured and you're precious to him. That's one of the things he's saying to us. Those are the things he said over Jesus. And that's what he's saying concerning us. The same John chapter 5 verse 20. John chapter 5 verse 20. It says, For the Father dearly loves the Son and shows him everything that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will be filled with wonders. So like I said to us, as this applies to Jesus, it applies to you. So you can actually say concerning yourself, for the Father dearly loves me. Amen. Or do you think we are speaking heresy here? So you can actually put yourself in that scripture. For the Father dearly loves me and shows me everything that he himself is doing. And the Father will show me greater works than this. So that what? I will be filled with wonders. So that's we said it to Jesus. So he's saying the same thing over us. So the next thing the word of the Father is confirming to us is that what? It's pleasure. And when you talk about pleasure, you're wondering, is the father proud of me? You know, there are some, some things that the, the a child would do, especially in, I'm talking about earthly father now, that, that you have, some of them will have children that they will say, after you do something, they will disown you. Or they don't even, they say the black sheep of the family. They have the people, they say, oh, this one doesn't speak well of the family. But there is nothing like that. Like the father is not... Um, it's not, it doesn't have a reputation, so to speak, to protect that. He's wondering, that, oh, I don't want this, this child of mine that backsteaded. I don't want people to start saying, oh, did, Jesus really, did, did God really bring him up well? It doesn't have a reputation to protect that. He's not going to run after you. You know, like um, you say uh, as a parent, you say, oh, I don't want this child to bring disgrace to the family. Let's say, for an instance, you have a daughter and the, the child um, has, um, got pregnant out of wedlock. Some parents will either 
force the child to, to either abort the pregnancy so that the world would not know that they had a child that did that. Or they will look for a way to patch that mistake. Like, make cosmetics, like, okay, we know you made, you, we still love you. And there are still some parents that they've done a very fantastic job. They went all out for their child. They loved on them. They made sure that, no, you've made one mistake. You're not going to make more mistakes. They brought that child in and loved on that. And that's the type of the, the father we have. He's not going to say because you backslided, because you stole, because you lied. Now, you're, you're on your own. That's not the father we have. He has, his pleasure is on us. So if you're wondering that, ah, is, is, is there anything that I'm going to do that the father is not going to be proud of? Like we said that when we sin, it grieves the father. But because it grieves him doesn't mean it's going to forsake you. Rather, he's going, to look what he's, going, he's going to look for actions to take to reconcile you back to himself. That's his heart towards us. So you are wondering, does he take delight in me? And we already saw that in, in Zechariah that we read that what the Lord takes delight in us. He's singing over us. And when you're thinking about the pleasure of God concerning you, you're thinking, is he pleased with who I am? So some of us, you're, if, you're, if you're a parent, there's a temptation. Like if you want to measure the achievements of your child, like so proud parent, you'll be like, oh, my first child is a doctor. The second one is a lawyer. The third one is a city councillor. Like, what happens to the fourth one that like, is, is still at home? Maybe it's 35 and still at home. You don't talk about the child. But that's not the God we serve. It takes the same way he's going to talk about that one that is still at home. It's still the same way he's going to talk about the one that is doing all of those great things. It grieves him that you're not going up into those things because he wants you to lay hold of all of those things he have available for you. But he's not going to describe you based on the things you have done or you haven't done. So that is hard for us. So it takes pleasure in us. John chapter 5 verse 44 to 41. 41 to 44. This one is Arabic because they read from the back. So John chapter 5 verse 41 to 44 says, I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. And that is it. God does not receive honor from men. So what people say about us does not influence his love for us. People, when people tell on you, like, God is not going to, do, like, you know the way back in Africa, because they said uh, the whole village raises a child, so the whole village reports you to your parents as well. <laughs> so the village, so I, I can remember some incidents, that the reason why I got spanked was not because my mom saw me doing that thing, it was because somebody else. But God does not, he's not going to punish you, he sees everything. But it doesn't take um, a stand against the enemy over his child. That's what I'm trying to bring out. God doesn't li listen to the accuser of the brain because that's what he's doing. He's listening to, I mean, he's just, uh, this, Satan is going around, toe and fro, looking for who he may devour. And so he, the Bible calls him what? The accuser of the brethren. So if God were to listen to all of his accusation against us, we shouldn't have any basis to come to the presence of God because Satan is pressing hard at him. Look at the way he kept going to God concerning Job. Going, kept going to God. Like the reason why this man is, is because, and that's why he's going to God concerning you. The reason why she's blessed is because you have an edge of mind. The reason, if God were to listen to all of his accusation against you and punish you for that, most of us would not be standing now. So God is not going to take a stand against the enemy for us. He's not going to punish us based on the enemy's accusation. So it, it takes, he's going to defend us. That's what I'm driving at. God is going to defend us. If at all the enemy is right, the Lord is going to call you in and rebuke you himself. That's the father we serve. He's going to call you in and rebuke you by himself. And the last thing is a place. And when you talk about a place, so we talked about the first thing he attacks. I mean, he speaks towards our identity, who we are in him. The second one is what? That we are loved unconditionally and he treasures us and we are precious to him. The third one is what? The pleasure. We bring him pleasure. We bring him delight. The last one is the issue of a place. So for us to understand, you know, I think the song we sang is what in my father's, one of the scriptures we read, it says, what well, I'm going to prepare a place for. It's a mansion. See, if it, if it were not so, I would let you know. If the building material was not going to be enough, I would let you know. But that is the assurance is given. It says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You remember when Jesus resurrected? And the, the, the Mary was going to hug him. Say, wait, let me go to my father. Let me ascend to my father. Let me go finish this job first. Let me go present you to the father blameless. 
let me go present you to the Father. The work concerning these ones have been done. They finished, I finished the work on their behalf. So there is a place for you. It's talking about purpose. It's talking about an assignment that the Father has for you. So you don't have to wonder if you have a if you belong here, if there's a place for you, if you have an assignment upon your life. No, you are in your father's house and there shouldn't be a struggle for you to belong. This house belongs to you. And I keep saying it here. And that's one thing the Lord had to teach me that I cannot go to any church on earth and I'll feel like I'm a first timer. I might be a first timer to that place, but I'm in my father's house. I, am, I should feel welcome. They should be singing, even if I don't understand the song, but I should feel that connection to my father in the father's house. And that's what happens when you know that you belong to the father. When you know you belong to the father, you are not a stranger. You are not a guest in your father's house. Not just when you're in believers' house. When you go to anywhere in the world, when you go to the gathering of believers, you should know that what there is a place for me here. So I'm going to hand it here, but next week I would, I would, I want to see, I want us to look at what happens when those four things, these four things, our identity is love for us, the pleasure of God over us, and our place in God is attacked. What happens to us? What happens to us? So we're going to, that's where I'm going to, to finish that up. But this morning, I just want you to go to God in, in case you, any of those things have been attacked in your life, probably your identity in Christ. A lot of us are having identity crisis. It's not just in the physical, even in the realm of the spirit. Some of us are carrying with us the burden of an orphan. We feel that we are a second class citizen of God, that God loves certain people more than us. We look at the story of Daniel, we look at the story of David, and we think these people are more preferred than we are. That's not the case. You know what Jesus said concerning John the Baptist? He says, of all the prophets that lived before now, he says, well, he is the greatest. But those that are coming, those that will believe in Jesus, John the Baptist is even the least. And that's the God we serve. So when we come to God through this Jesus, there's a, there's a change in our identity. Whatever name you've been called before now, that you are no good, or people have looked at you and they think um, you are not going to surmount to much, whatever it is, or even your parents, they know that, well, you're a good child, but they don't think much of you. Can you just go to God this morning and just say, Lord, brand my life for you. Brand my life for you. Remember when you're going to buy a designer bag, what makes that designer bag a designer bag or designer cloth or whatever it is, is the brand of the maker on that item. That's what makes it a designer. But you have the designer of designers. The designer of designer, the one who makes is the creator of heaven and earth. Is the one that made us in his image. Can you just ask that Lord, brand my life for you, oh God. Put your mark upon my life. Brand my life for you that wherever I go, I represent you. People see your image and your brand upon me. And my life speak for you in the name of Jesus. Father, this is our heart cry this morning, oh God. We trade every identity that we've had that is contrary to your identity for us. That is contrary to the words you've spoken over us. This morning, we trade them for the love of the Father. We trade them for what you are speaking over us. You are speaking mercy over us. You are speaking kindness over us. You are speaking judgment over our enemies. This morning, oh God, we trade all of those baggages of the past. We trade them for the life of Jesus. And I want to pray this morning, if there's anyone in here that has an issue with their earthly father, either the father is living or not, and you just want the Lord to speak to your heart. I just want if you're watching in, online or you're here in person. And that has actually tainted your relationship with God. I want to pray with you this morning. I want you to just raise your hand. I want to agree with the Lord that Lord, just start afresh for us. In the name of Jesus, if there's anyone here, if you've had an issue with your earthly father or you didn't even have the opportunity to experience the, the love of the father and you're thinking, probably because I didn't even know my father that much, that is affecting me the way I'm relating with God. This morning, we lift that hole into, onto you, God. We ask that you fill it with your love. In the name of Jesus, 
We ask that you fill that all, O oh God, with your love in the name of Jesus. That vacuum that has been created, O oh God, by any father figure or our earthly father, O oh God, that is making us to see you wrongly, to perceive you wrongly. We ask, O oh God, that you heal our hearts, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. We ask, O oh God, that you heal those hearts in the name of Jesus. Let the love of God, O oh God, let it, let it overwhelm us this morning, O oh God. Let your word, let it do a restorative work in our hearts. Let your love, let it do a restorative work in our hearts. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We give you praise, O oh God. In Jesus' name we have prayed.